and welcome to Hungry for Comfort. My name is Caitlin Wainwright, and I'm the manager of Fort York National Historic Site, one of 10 Toronto History Museums. I am pleased to host the fourth and final session in this Hungry for Comfort series, Chinese Food, Diversity and Delights. This session focuses on global and local perspectives. We acknowledge that the land we are gathering on today is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and the Williams Treaties signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. The bonds and promises made in this treaty have created a special relationship that is over 215 years old. It helps to remind us that we are all treaty people. This may start with a respectful recitation of a land acknowledgement, but we as Torontonians also have a duty to understand the terms of this treaty because it is our treaty too. Hungry for Comfort is an exploration of diverse culinary food stories. This year, the spotlight is on Toronto's Chinese communities. These stories will hopefully educate, inspire, and connect you to their culinary history through this safe online platform. Chinese Food, Diversity and Delights has been curated by Chef Leo Chan and historian Arlene Chan. I'd like to introduce them both. Born in Macau and raised in Hong Kong, Leo came to Canada in 1966. He was educated at York University, Ryerson, and Cornell in Ithaca, New York and has taught at George Brown and Humber Colleges. He has also held senior positions in hotel and restaurant chains in Canada. Arlene is an award-winning Chinatown historian who has written seven books about the history, culture, and traditions of the Chinese in Canada. Her books are available in the Toronto History Museum shop online, and the link to the shop is available below. Arlene's family stories and firsthand experiences in Toronto's Chinatown are woven into her speaking engagements and Chinatown tours. I'd like to welcome Arlene. I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Chuck Kwan. Chuck grew up in Singapore, Hong Kong, and Japan. His Chinese restaurant television series brings together his diasporic experience and love of food and travel. Chuck's forthcoming book, have You Eaten Yet? draws out a global narrative of the Chinese diaspora by linking together personal stories from Chinese kitchens worldwide. Chuck, I can't wait to hear about your travels and eating Chinese food around the world. Hello, everyone. I'm going to present to you today uh, the film series that I've made. It's a 15 part series called Chinese restaurants. I spent four years between 2000 and 2003 traveling to five continents and 15 countries, getting stories from the Chinese diaspora. Uh, these are stories of uh, migration, uh, stories about food, how Chinese people have brought their food and culture into the new land, and as, as well as social political forces that shape their uh, destination. I would now like to share with you uh, 15 of these spots that I went to uh, by showing you a, a food photo. But I will tell you a little bit about the um, background story of the Chinese restaurant owner. In Israel, uh, our uh, restaurant owner uh, is actually a Vietnamese Chinese folk people. Uh, who came in the 70, late 70s to Israel. He was taken in by the Israeli government as part of the worldwide campaign to uh, assist in, in humanitarian relief for uh, refugees fleeing Vietnam. And one of the stories, of course, in Chinese restaurants is whether it's kosher or not. In South Africa, we have a third generation South African Chinese uh, who had to get permit to marry her husband, her Chinese husband from China, because Chinese from China were considered white. Uh, she is considered color. And the uh, third restaurant I have is uh, Istanbul, Turkey. This is a family who fled Mao's revolution in 1949, went over the Himalayas and actually practically walked from China into Pakistan and then subsequently to Turkey. 
um, and of course, they serve halal food because uh, the the dumplings you see here are actually beef dumplings and not pork dumplings. In the middle of the Indian Ocean, we have a, a, more, uh, a Hakka Indian Creole fusion because a lot of the immigrants here are from Hakka region of China, as well as Indians and, and of course, local uh, Creole uh, population. So our second generation owner here uh, combined uh, the three tradition of cooking into her own fusion dish. We went to uh, Symphana, uh, we went to Trinidad uh, to participate uh, uh, in the carnival to play mass, as they say. And uh, this is a, a restaurant owner who came to Trinidad when he was 11 years old to help out his father in the grocery store. And he eventually opened his Song's Great Wall. Havana, Cuba um, does not have very good Chinese food. In fact, the most popular menu item seems to be pizza. Uh, all the Chinese restaurants do take out pizza uh, for, uh, for their customers. And, uh, and uh, just as well, the, the owner had actually come uh, to um, Cuba as a young man uh, from Hong Kong. And he has been there, of course, ever since. We have the freshest seafood in Madagascar, uh, just because the town Tamataf is right next to the Indian Ocean. And here you see is a red snapper being uh, chopped up for food. Uh, uh, the owner, uh, amazingly, has never been to China. So uh, she had read all these Chinese magazines uh, from Hong Kong, cooking magazine from Hong Kong, and she actually uh, made a, a fantastic, wonderful meal for us. Speaking about Hong Kong, we have a Hong Kong couple uh, who came from Sweden. They had uh, immigrated to Sweden for a long time. And then when the Norway oil boom came on, they traveled to Tromso, the north of the Arctic Circle, and run a Hong Kong style uh, restaurant called Little Buddha. We all know about stories about Chinese Canadian prairies. Uh, every single little town has it. Uh, in our town in Outlook, Saskatchewan, we have a character called Noisy Jim. And uh, of course he serves chop suey, bacon and eggs, and pork chop and French fries. In Peru, uh, Chinese restaurants are known as chifa. And chifa is also the word they use for Chinese food. So we can hear people saying, let's go chifa. So let's go Chinese food. And chifa actually came from the Hakka term, have you eaten? Chifa, chifa. So in that sense, uh, have you eaten your rice? And, uh, and that be become the uh, Peruvian lingual into, uh, that shows you how spread into the uh, Peruvian culture that Chinese uh, settlements are in Peru. We have the only professional trained chef uh, in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, he and his wife had actually fled China during the Cultural Revolution by swimming to Hong Kong, uh, uh, a four or five hour swim. Uh, they, they are known as the freedom swimmers. Uh, they settled in Hong Kong and then they migrated to uh, Brazil and opened this restaurant, which makes, as you can see, uh, a wonderful homemade egg tart. In Argentina, we have a Taiwan immigrant who became known as the Spring Road King of Argentina. And here he is showing me how to make uh, spring roll skin from scratch. Uh, everybody has known about the chili chicken in Toronto because that's a favorite Indo Hakka restaurant dish. And I made a point of going to Kolkata to trace the origin of this dish and talk to the owner there, who are uh, two second generation Hakka Chinese in India. I went to the Amazon and uh, enjoy indigenous uh, Amazonian fish um, that came into the market. The owner, a Taiwan immigrant, um, took me around and uh, we even had uh, Priyana, which is the man-eating fish. So I'm looking at it as a revenge for mankind against the fish. Finally, in Mumbai, India, again, next to the Indian Ocean, uh, we get fresh seafood every day, every night, uh, from the ocean and as a result the restaurant uh, and its branch in New Delhi gets 
uh, you know, fresh seafood flown in every day and uh, serves one of the most uh, freshest seafood that I've seen uh, anywhere in the world. As Arlene have told you, uh, I have compiled these 15 stories into a book called Have You Eaten Yet? This will be coming out next Chinese New Year. There's a Cantonese saying called going to the sky's edge with a walk. Basically, um, it talks about going globally around the world with just a walk that will be enough for you to survive in your new environment. Uh, a bit about Chinese food, it has become globalized. Uh, it's just like what people have known back home. So you have the Indo Hakka restaurant here in Toronto, where the customers are all Indian and Pakistanis because that's the Chinese food they know back home. Uh, which brings up to the, the question of authenticity. And I always talk about uh, your childhood memory of what food is, is basically what is authentic to you. And of course, as, as I mentioned before, uh, Chinese are very adapted at uh, adapting their culture and, and their cuisine into local environment, resulting in fusion and hybrids. Chinese cooking talks about the three things that are important in a dish, uh, color, fragrance, and taste. In the Cantonese cooking, they talk about uh, having a high firepower wok that can stir up the whole dish and gives it a breath of a wok, which is a very kind of a, uh, um, undescribable kind of way uh, that you, you, you would know it when you have it. Chinese food is, of course, all about yin and yang balance. Uh, there's a difference between hot food and cold food and neutral food. And food as lubricants uh, for the winter time, for chilly weather and food as medicine. Uh, sea cucumber, for example, is very good for your kidney. Finally, Chinese talk about harmonizing the five tastes, the sweet, the saltiness, the sour, the bitterness, and the spiciness into one uh, holistic whole. And add to that the sixth taste that was discovered in the 60s by a Japanese uh, scientist, which is umami, which is what the basis is of MSG. I feature a lot of classic Chinese dish in my uh, in every chapter. Uh, we have steam whole fish and ginger scallion, my favorite. There's the Sichuan Mapo Dofu, the Hakka pork belly with preserved vegetables, and the Sichuan twice cooked pork. Finally, I feature also the Cantonese double boil soup that uh, is served in a lot of the banquets. The adaptation then leads to what we are known uh, I hate to use the word fusion, but basically people are now talking about hybrid Chinese, basically combining uh, a food culture, uh, food cooking from two sort of streams. Uh, we have the aforementioned Indo Hakka chili chicken. Uh, and soup shinoas is basically Chinese soup or basically wonton soup. It's the national dish of Madagascar. They eat it for breakfast, for lunch, and for dinner. Lomo saltato is a Peruvian dish. It's basically stir-fried beef with onions and tomato, but with a Peruvian touch. They use a very hot, uh, spicy uh, Andean yellow pepper called ají amarillo, and they use and they stir-fry in the Andean potato into the dish. So you have both French fries and rice with your dish. And finally, I want to talk about this whole kind of intermixing of Chinese food. Um, we all heard about Singaporean crab. Those who've been to Singapore knows about that. Uh, of course, it's, it's a crab dish invented in Singapore. That's why it's called in Singaporean cra uh, crab. However, the, set, the same cannot be said about Singaporean vermicelli or Singaporean fried rice. There's no such thing in Singapore. Uh, Singapore vermicelli was invented in Hong Kong by the Hong Kong people because they think that uh, if you put a little curry in there, they'll make it Singaporean. And of course, uh, Singapore fried rice was invented in India. So only in India, you'll see Singapore fried rice in your menu. So this is basically to wrap up uh, the Chinese food, uh, Chinese restaurant owners that I visited, all adapt to new environments and, and, and basically not the other way around. So they're, they're, they're good at getting the customers uh, making your food uh, uh, suitable to the local taste. And this 
is basically the story of the Chinese restaurant owners. Thank you so much, Chuck. You've touched on so many topics, um, you know, the Chinese diaspora, moving to a new land and the, you know, overcoming obstacles, adjusting, adapting to deliver Chinese food in their new, new um, country. So, um, so interesting. And you've gone, I mean, the experience you've had of going to so many restaurants around the world, and I know you've given us a real quick snapshot of the, the, the various restaurants that you did visit. But are there one or two that really stand out, one or two that really touched you more deeply than others? I mean, all of the stories are so incredible, but there must have been a few that really resonated uh, with you. Well, uh, food-wise, I would say uh, uh, a uh, Brazil, my professional chef who made the egg tarts, and also um, the lady from Tamata of Madagascar who have never been to China, but made a wonderful uh, seafood restaurant with fresh seafood. So those are, the, I would say culinary wise, those are the two best restaurants that I've been to in terms of food. But the most interesting thing are not, of course, not food. Um, it's the stories of immigrants and, and hardship they've been through. And I would just pick two. Um, Noisy Jim in Outlook Saskatchewan, uh, that's not his real name. Uh, but every customer call him Noisy Jim because he runs a Chinese cafe in in uh, in a small town called Outlook, and uh, he would uh, run it to until he died. Um, and basically, uh, it was a community center. He he would leave uh, keys uh, with the customers so that they can open the restaurant before he gets up and make their own coffee. So these are farmers who come into the to the restaurant to have their morning coffee or their bread, or even making their own bacon and eggs. And then as they leave, they will leave the money in, in, in the counter so that, uh, you know, the day he got sick or the day he couldn't get up in the morning, uh, the customers would do that. Uh, of course, the most touching story is, uh, is Cuba. Um, Cuba was, Havana uh, was the biggest Chinatown in Latin America. And it was the three, one of the three biggest Chinatowns, San Francisco, Lima, and Havana, were the three biggest Chinatowns in North America, uh, in, in the Americas. And uh, the story about Chinese there are very, very sad in the sense that there's only about 300 Chinese left. Uh, everybody else is all interracially mixed uh, because they came as indentured laborers, and they, of course, with no women, they marry only local uh, Cuban women, uh, be it white or black or brown. So there is a famous saying uh, that uh, every Cuban is one third Chinese, one third Spanish and one third black. So um, so what we are seeing in the Chinatown is a very actually a very sad uh, scene of of people with one eighth or one fourth Chinese descent trying to make a living. In a, in, a, in a dying Chinatown. Uh, I use the word decay, uh, which is actually quite apt uh, for, for that environment. Well, I really look forward to reading um, Have You Eaten Yet? And so um, can't wait to read, read your book. So I'd like to now um, hand things over to Leo for our next speakers. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you the moderator of the panel, Mr. Karong Lu. He is the food reporter of Toronto Star, who has delighted the diverse people and that make up the city's cuisines. And how they speak to the history and where the food scene is going. Karong will in turn introduce the distinguished panel members, a young corporate executive who was the winner of the top 30 under 30, a project and event manager of the Chinatown BIA and a current winner of the Dr. Lincoln Alexander Award for Community Service and an award winning TV host, a celebrity chef, 
and a restaurateur. Mr. Caron Blue, over to you. Thank you for the introduction, Leo. Like you said, my job at the Star is more than just zipping around the city and eating everything in sight, despite what my parents think. That <laughs> They think that's all I've been doing for the last 10 years. My goal at the Star is to explore through its food, the city's people, histories, culture, and its future. What really interested me in this whole series is that Chinese food, particularly in the greater Toronto area, it's so varied. And I think if I asked everyone on this chat and everyone watching to think about Chinese food, their favorite dish, their definition of the cuisine, we're all gonna think about completely different things. So it's fantastic that our speakers here today come from such different backgrounds and can give us some insight onto what Chinese cooking means to them and how it's changed in their fields. As the name of tonight's session suggests, it's all about looking at Chinese cooking from a global as well as a local perspective and how it's evolved, where it's going, and just where we are now. The first speaker that uh, I'm introducing is Tina Chu. For those that are watching, you might not be familiar with her name, but I'll give you two words, Mandarin restaurants. Tina joined the Mandarin in 2000 and is currently the Chief Operating Officer. She also serves on the boards of Restaurant Canada, an association representing the country's restaurants, as well as Humber College. Now, before you begin, Tina, let it be known that when I met my partner, he was halfway through getting his PhD, and we promised each other that when he successfully defended his thesis, we're going to celebrate at the Mandarin. It was at the, uh, the early bird shift at the Eglinton location, and even though my family has been going to the Mandarin for as long as I can remember for like birthdays and anniversaries, it was the first time that I felt truly fancy because I treated myself and ordered an Oreo shake, which is, I can still taste it to this day. So Tina, how often do people come up to you with their own Mandarin stories over the years? Well, Karon, when people find out where I work, they often share a story about a time they visited one of our restaurants. So that happens very, very often to answer your question. Hello everyone. Thank you for inviting me to be part of today's panel. I thought I would start off with a brief story about our history. Then I will talk a bit about our food. Here you can see from left to right, our founders, James Chu, Casey Chang, Diana Chu, and George Chu. It was the late seventies and they were living in Montreal. They heard there was a restaurant for sale in Brampton, Ontario. All of them had previous restaurant experience, so they thought, let's take a chance and purchase this restaurant. So in 1979, they founded Mandarin. The restaurant seated about 100 people and served an a la carte menu of what people call chop suey style dishes or American Canadian Chinese food. If you look at the top image, you may notice that there is a baby in the photo. And at the risk of letting you know approximately how old I am, that baby is me. James is my father, George and Diana are my uncle and aunt. Many of my early memories of are of the sights, sounds, and smells of a restaurant. In the 1980s, we introduced a new format, the buffet. And this is the format we have become known for over the years. People sometimes ask why a buffet? It was not a popular model at that time. My father says that many customers would ask about all the different dishes on the menu, many of which were new to them. So they thought that the buffet would be a great way to let customers try a variety of items without having to commit to a full dish. Of course, over the years, our buffet has changed and this is what our tables look like now. We used to call ourselves a Chinese Canadian buffet, but we have become more multicultural over the years. While we still have the Chinese Canadian type dishes, we have added a variety of things over the years, such as sushi, a grill area with pizza and a prime rib counter. This is what some of our restaurants look like now. We now have 29 locations across Ontario. Our locations average about 12,000 square feet and seat about 350 people. In 2002, we opened our corporate headquarters in Brampton, which includes our restaurant, our head office, and a 9,000 square foot banquet hall. Each of our restaurants is operated by five franchise partners two who run the back of the house, the kitchen, and three who run the front of the house. We like to promote from within, so all of our franchisees have to first work at a location before becoming management. 
This is our franchisee and executive team. Over 145 people who have immigrated for almost all of the different regions in China, as well as about nine other countries. We are most known for our buffet, but what some people may not realize is that we also do takeout and delivery. And we've actually been doing takeout and delivery since we first opened our doors in 1979. We have over 100 dishes on our takeout menu, a sample of which you can see here. Now, I don't want to talk much about the pandemic because that is a whole other topic, but I do want to mention that when the pandemic hit, many restaurants had to pivot to set up takeout and delivery programs. We were lucky in the sense that we had already been operating with these programs in place. This is one of our locations delivering meals to frontline workers. However, because we have not been al allowed to open the buffet due to the pandemic, we developed Mandarin Small Eats. We selected our top dishes and plated them in small portions in a paper dish model, similar to dim sum. Our restaurants, which are open for dine-in, are serving this menu. People often ask how we develop our menu. When we think about new dishes, we consider many factors. Availability of quality ingredients, cost of ingredients, cost of prep, menu real estate, how it will hold on our buffet or in our takeout container, and most importantly, customer appeal. In terms of customer appeal, we think about trends, if customers like the item, and also if they think the item is a fit with our brand. This slide shows a key question when we develop our menus. Do we go with what our customers know and love? On the left is our most popular dinner for four takeout package. Or do we try new dishes, which may be representative of different cuisines? On the right is a thousand year old egg salad with tofu, which we introduced a few years ago. For us, it is about finding the right balance. And we found it works well to bring new items out through short term festival promotions. This gives us a chance to introduce some festival, sometimes more traditional items to our customers. And this works especially well with our buffet format. It's not enough for us to just guess what our customers will like, because as we know, tastes are constantly changing. So we ask for feedback. For example, we do taste testings. We invite customers, ideally from different areas of Ontario and from various demographics to try potential and or existing items and give their input. Many of our current recipes are a result of these tastings. And you can see some of our tastings here. Obviously these are pre-COVID times. As a fun fact, not only have we had the opportunity to introduce various dishes to our customers over the years, but we have actually taken some of our customers to Asia to eat the food right at the source. We celebrated our milestone anniversaries. That's the 20 year, 25 year, 30, 35 and 40 year marks by having year long contests and we took the winners of those contests to Japan and China. To date, we have taken over 200 customers abroad. As I mentioned, we use festivals as a way to showcase new dishes. The most important celebration in our culture is Lunar New Year. And at Mandarin, this is one of our major promotions. Some of my friends have told me that they know it's Chinese New Year when they hear the Mandarin commercials on the radio. This year, we started the new year, the Year of the Ox, on February the 12th. When we do a festival, we don't just add some of the foods associated with the festival. We also introduce some of the customs and culture. Red is a lucky color for the Chinese. So during Chinese New Year, we create a festive atmosphere using a variety of red decorations, props, and even costumes. This is our Brampton restaurant. And you can see we've hung up over 1500 lanterns for a Chinese New Year. Now for the food. Dumplings are a symbol of good luck, so are often enjoyed during Chinese New Year, in addition to other dishes which represent happiness and longevity. Some families gather together and make dumplings from scratch, but if you are like me, you may buy them from a store or go to a restaurant. We've been doing the Mandarin Dumpling Festival for a number of years, and in this festival, we feature a variety of dumplings, a few of which are shown here. Many of you may know it is tradition to give out a red envelope with money inside during Chinese New Year. We also share that tradition with our customers by giving out red envelopes. However, unfortunately, we don't give out cash, but rather a lucky souvenir coin. In addition to dumplings, we have added other items to our New Year menu, some of which are shown here. These are the examples of the signs that we put up on the buffet. You can see that there is a short description of the items, and sometimes we include the Chinese name so that our customers can learn more about what they're eating. 
And there is that thousand year old egg salad you saw earlier in the bottom corner. For those of you who may not know, by the way, thousand year old eggs are Chinese preserved eggs and not really thousand years old. Another important festival for our culture is the Mid-Autumn Festival, also known as the Moon Festival. So we launched the Mandarin Moon Festival many years ago. Like the Chinese New Year celebrations, we use this festival as a chance to share some of the food and customs of this holiday with our guests. Moon Festival, which happens in the fall, celebrates the time when the moon is at the fullest and brightest. Families will traditionally gather, light lanterns, and look at the moon. You can see here that once again, we have lanterns displayed in our restaurants. In terms of the menu, we add various harvest inspired items, such as dishes with pumpkin, roast duck, etc. Probably the most well-known element of the Moon Festival is the moon cake, which is traditionally given out and eaten during this time. The roundness of the moon cake is meant to symbolize the full moon and the union of family. Here are two more signs that we had on the buffet to show the moon cakes we had available. This is an example of us tailoring our items to our customers' preferences. We had tested moon cakes with our taste testers to determine the most preferred fillings. Also, moon cakes traditionally have egg yolks inside. In our version, we remove them to make them more approachable. If you look closely, you can see the M on the moon cake. That is actually the M from our logo as we had these cakes custom made for our moon festival. In addition to the buffet signs, we also have placemats on the guest tables. These placemats are not only used to advertise drinks, but we use them to describe festivals. This is an example of a moon festival placemat. You will see there is a woman and there's some text where we give an explanation about the festival. I won't get into the story now with the time we have here, but if you want to know more, I believe we have an expert here. Arlene Chan wrote a book about it. You can also see that this placemat promotes bubble tea, a drink which originated in Taiwan. We actually tried to sell bubble tea a few times. Bubble tea is now ubiquitous, but the first time we sold it was in 2002 and bubble tea was still unfamiliar to many in our markets. But for us, it was a chance to once again, try something new. In the end, our classic dishes are what our customers turn to the most. Here you can see some of our most well-known dishes. These items have been on our original menu since we opened over 40 years ago. However, we do like to say that they are descendants of the originals as they've changed over time as we continuously try to improve our menu items. You might see one of your favorites here, but our top seller is sweet and sour chicken balls. Last year, we produced about 2.3 million chicken balls. So thank you once again for listening. I hope that you have learned a bit more about Mandarin and how we approach food. I also hope that I've made you hungry as I know I am now, and that maybe you will think of us the next time you're planning your meal. Thank you very much. All right, thank you for your presentation, Tina. Um, I know that this is a hot take, but I prefer mooncakes without egg yolks, so thank you very much for that. Um, our next speaker that uh, I'm introducing is someone that I've worked with a few times uh, at the Star. Uh, Lucia Huang is the project and advance manager of the Toronto Chinatown BIA. Now, for those of you out there that don't know what a BIA is, Lucia will explain that to you. Um, let me tell you, before the taping of this, I was asking her if she could explain, you know, X, Y, and Z. And she just emailed back like two seconds after, don't worry, I already have it covered in my presentation. Which makes sense because when you're an events manager, you're already 10 steps ahead of everyone. Um, so what's really great about Lucia is that she's been doing fantastic work bridging the gap between a lot of the businesses in downtown Chinatown with people like me who want to learn more about the area, its people, its business, and its history. So I'm gonna be quiet and let Lucia do her thing. So thanks for joining us, Lucia. Thank you, Carol. Hi, everyone. My name is Lucia. I'm the project and event manager at Chinatown BIA. I feel so honored to join all the VIPs here today. Um, so about Chinatown. Chinatown, uh, uh, Chinatown BIA, uh, the full name is Chinatown Business Improvement Area. It's a city of Toronto agency uh, formed by property and business owners. And it's one of the 83 BIAs in Toronto. We're focusing on the economic develop de development for the area through preserve the Chinese heritage and culture, improve Chinatown's landscape, health and safety, 
and create as exciting community events, projects, and last but not least, we advocate for our local business owners. As a result, we're hoping to create more uh, employment opportunities and uh, invite new business to join the area. And a little bit about myself, I have been working in Shanahan BI for around uh, five, uh, sorry, four years. Um, and because we have mostly two staff um, most of the time, so I got to manage a lot of different projects and I learned a lot about Chinatown through my interactions with the business owners, the board of directors, and people who really care about Chinatown. It is a very fascinating community that needs all our support. Before I start to talk about the business in Chinatown, I want to start with the, my favorite Chinese saying, um, the empire cannot be without people, people cannot be without food. It shows how important that food is for Asian people. From my memories, whenever there is an important occasion, we sit down and eat together. And that has been something that rooted in my mind. I always like to invite friends to go to either a restaurant or my house just to share food together to celebrate a, a special occasion of life. So if we talk about Chinatown a little bit, a lot of people might think that it's only Chinese cuisine because of the name of Chinatown, but it's actually more than just Chinese food. The West Chinatown located in Dundas and Spadina reflects a portion of the Canadian history. The immigration waves has been changing the variety of the uh, restaurant in Chinatown. In the beginning, most of the restaurants are focusing on Southern Chinese cuisine. Later on, we have Vietnamese and other East Southeast Asian coming into the community. And in the past few years, the trends actually reflects the cuisine that it's very popular in China. For example, we have more uh, rice noodles and uh, Sichuan hot pots. Uh, I remember when I joined Chinatown BI, there was only one rice noodle, which is my favorite <laughs> cuisine uh, so far. Uh, right now we have uh, at least three new uh, rice noodle restaurants in Chinatown right now. And we are actually seeing young entrepreneurs, Asian young entrepreneurs starting their new restaurants. Uh, for example, Big Trouble Pizza, they are selling their unique fusion pizzas. We have Icha Tea, they're uh, bringing tea ceremony for people who like to learn about tea. Uh, and we have R&D, they bring the Chinese food to a different level using some Western presentation and ingredients to serve the customers. In the future, I think Chinatown will have both new entrepreneurs and the current local old business to serve the um, affordable cuisines and exclusive menus. So this slide, I just want to show you portion of the food in Chinatown. I know I'm making you hungry again. Um, and it's how I feel every day when I work in Chinatown, to be honest, every day, all our staff ask this question, what should we have for lunch? So next I want to talk about how uh, Chinatown BI is supporting our restaurants. So we have been helping all our business, including restaurants to promote their products and uh, service in different ways. The pandemic speeds up uh, and enlarge the challenges that all our business are having. Um, in the past year, our service has become more frequently used by all business and that includes um, the newsletter we send to all our members uh, and we translate in uh, Chinese and English uh, to share all our members. And we are also the bridge between the city and the business owners. For example, if our business want to learn how to apply for a permit, how to start a patio in this moment, uh, we are the one who tell them the correct information, uh, refer them to the right department to talk to the city. Uh, we also assist, encourage business to improve their online presence. This is an ongoing and extended program from the city and the province with free consultations, consultation service and tools, including we take 360 Google, uh, photos for their Google Maps. And uh, throughout this service, I found a very great uh, result of our service. Um, 
So at the House of Gourmet, if you're familiar with the restaurant, they actually started their social media just a few months ago, and they're actually performing really well. Um, after the post, after they posted their Lunar New Year special offer, we have been seeing lineups in front of their restaurants for the week of Lunar New Year celebration. The next, we talk about the story of the Chinatown business. So on the top of our service, we also created new campaigns to feature our business. One of them is the storytelling videos. So as you can see from the video right now, we create a documentary style uh, video focusing on the stories of the owners in Chinatown. And sometimes we intentionally uh, film them in a different language. For example, the one you're seeing right now is actually in Mandarin and we put the English subtitle under. I feel like sometimes we might need just a little bit knowledge about a place to trigger our interest in visiting the store or the community. For example, after I film this uh, dumpling video, I feel so hungry and I have been eating dumpling uh, a lot of, in a lot of locations. And we're hoping all videos are creating, we're creating will provide people a picture of the community. So we are trying to uh, interact with different business um, and different angle. For example, I intentionally find, um, for example, a different background of Chinese operating a different business. Because I want to show you how Chinatown are very different from you imagine if you're not familiar with the community. The next one is the 4D Chinatown experience. Um, I think we all agree that sometimes takeout food is just not the same. Without the background noise, for example, the dim sum place, you have the lady who pushes the little cart and asks you if you want to have a shrimp or pork dumplings. If you don't have that experience, it feels like it's not dim sum anymore. So this is the initial idea of the 40 Chinatown project that I want to create an environment, recreate a similar environment for people to feel like they are still in the store when they're enjoying the food, but yet cannot be in the restaurant for any of the reasons. And COVID is just one of the reasons. So this is an innovation project that founded by the city. And we have, uh, we, again, we invited the business owners to talk about their stories in every video. So the current video you are seeing is a 360 degree. Uh, we put it on YouTube and our website, so you can visit it uh, when you have a chance. And my favorite scene in this video is the kitchen part. I have never visited a Chinatown uh, restaurant into the kitchen until I have this opportunity uh, to film this video. And I never thought about a restaurant when they make things on themselves, they need to hire so many staffs. So you can see in the video, they have a lot of staff working together. Someone is just folding the, um, the, the dumplings, someone is steaming the dumplings. It's very impressive for me. And I really wanted to share this joy with people that this is amazing. This is how we create food for you. The next one is the events. So although a lot of our events are not directly related to our local business, but for us, it's another way um, to remind people the culture elements of Chinatown and create a reason for people to visit the community. So the example you can see here is the human exhibition. We collaborated with Steps Public Arts. We, there were 10 workshops with over 130 participants in 2021. Through the workshops, people share their memories of Lunar New Year and Chinatown. So we have people talk about uh, their experience in Chinatown, their favorite restaurant, and they actually throw, draw it on the paper or they create a short video of it. The two artists, Puff Patty and Winnie Tron, are both Asian artists. They build the lanterns and the stop motion videos for people to enjoy the Lunar New Year celebration atmosphere in Chinatown. That's my presentation today. I believe the beautiful community will have lots of potentials in the future. If you had a chance to explore the community, I'd like to invite you to explore it online or in person one day. Thank you. Thank you, Licia. Uh, be sure to follow the official Chinatown BIA Instagram page. The handle is at 
Toronto Chinatown. It's full of gorgeous photos and mini profiles of all the businesses. And it's honestly chock full of takeout options and places that you've probably walked by a million times but have never gone into. It's such a fantastic resource. Our last panelist for the day is Chef Roger Mooking, who most of you recognize from the Food Network Canada or all of his cookbooks that you've seen on display at the store. Or if you're, you know, a certain generation like myself, you remember seeing uh, all the bases bases videos being played around the clock on Much Music. But you know, be sure to check out his new uh, album, Eat Your Words, on streaming uh, platforms everywhere. It's it's quite good. Um, it's fantastic that uh, Roger is here because his style of cooking really exemplifies just how varied and personal Chinese cooking can be. It's constantly changing and evolving through migration and cultures coming together. It's, well, I'll let him talk about that. Um, hey, Roger, how are you? I'm good. I'm good, Karon. How are you? I'm holding in there. Yeah, yeah, um, cool. Before we get into the discussion of food, can you talk about your family background, um, particularly from your grandfather's side? Yeah, so my grandfather was born in uh, Guangdong province in, in China. Um, he left China around the 1920s-ish, I, I believe, around then. We, we actually don't know what his birthday is because it's a very long story. <laughs> but anyways, around 1920s, um, he left and he, and he was searching for s several things. He was uh, believed that El Dorado was in South America, so he was hunting gold. Uh, he ran out of money on the northern tip of Trinidad, um, and in very limited English, he explained that he was trying to get to South America. Um, so the boat captain said, okay, I'll take you. So he took him from the north end of Trinidad and dropped him off at the southern tip of Trinidad and says, here you are in South America. <laughs> so he got bamboozled and then he was stuck in Trinidad. So he ended up making a life there. I met my grandmother, who was a Trinidadian African woman, had my father. Um, and here I came along. So I was born in Trinidad um, in a West Indian Chinese influence household. My mother has Spanish and Dutch and a bunch of stuff. And so a very mixed household. But, you know, the fulcrums of our household were we would eat like uh, dumplings and dim sum for breakfast and then have curry goat for lunch. And then and then the mix of both, you know, for for dinner, you know, so and I thought everybody grew up like that, but apparently not. Um, and then when I was five, I came to Canada and I moved to Edmonton, Alberta, and I've been in the Toronto area since I was about 15, 16 years old. Right. So with that, you know, from your grandfather's lineage and, you know, just from moving around, how has that really shaped your cooking? Because I feel like from all the backgrounds, your family's uh, background, you know, it isn't the strict Chinese cooking that most people would think about. So when you're cooking or if you're coming up with new recipes, is there a particular style or any dish that kind of incorporates some sort of Guangdong Chinese Trinidadian <laughs> slash Edmontonian Torontonian cooking? Well, you know, a lot of what I do in my restaurants is a mix of all of those types of things, really and essentially, right? So it, it's interesting that you say that because, you know, I just talked to my mom just now and she was telling me how my dad was making stuffed bitter melon steam with the pork and all this stuff. And, you know, That's we just made Chinese. it. Yeah, it's very, <laughs> very, 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 <laughs> very Chinese, right? And I, I, you know, like, I, it's not, it's just a regular thing. So it's like, oh, you know, we, we call it karaili, right? So it's like, oh, we had some stuffed karaili with the thing and the steam, your father's steaming it right now. And so we were just always in that environment. Then I moved to Edmonton and um, we're surrounded by a lot of Ukrainians. Uh, and so I kind of got to see a lot of that stuff, right? And I think that it really leans back to our family tradition. My, my grandfather was very nomadic, my father as well. Um, and now I'm kind of carrying on that tradition of the Hakka, um, kind of nomadic, you know, I travel the globe doing all this food culture stuff uh, and music related stuff, and I'm able to dive in. So when I'm in Singapore, I'm looking for what's happening in Singapore, and I always find those Chinese references that mix with other cultures or in Malaysia, or I go to Australia and I hunt out really great Chinese food there. 
you know, some of the best Chinese food I've had is in this restaurant called uh, Miss Miss Wong in in Australia, right? And I was not expecting that, but it was it was incredible, incredible, incredible. And like Canada, it's very diverse and multicultural. So you see, like the future of of the cuisine is really like this melting pot. Um, steeped in very deep rooted traditions, but there's this melting pot thing happening. So in my restaurants or when I'm cooking, you know, I might not specifically make one specific dish or technique from the Guangdong province, but I'll take elements of that, like the way that um, the, the the Chinese master chef will boil the stock so it rolls and the collagen, the fat emulsifies into the stock is different than the way the French chef will do it. But I tend to lean towards the tradition of the Chinese chef because it's so rich and silky and creamy and there's a breath and the gelatin and the real essence of, of the chicken or whatever I'm cooking really comes out and then I fold that into other recipes right so I'm always pulling those techniques and drawing them in so I don't know if that's uh, truly Chinese food f future or it's just the future of global cuisine in general and and chinese is such a, a strong uh culture in that pantheon of recipes um that i think it holds its its weight you know one of my favorite things is hakas salted chicken it's a steamed salted chicken with the spring onions and ginger oil um i don't do nothing mixed up with that i do it exactly as my father did it and how his father showed me and it's just a magical thing, you know. That's one of my comfort foods, right next to goat roti. Yeah, well, I mean, it's a more. In -depth <laughs> answer. I thought you were gonna say something like mapo tofu doubles or something like that. <laughs> Yo, and I'll get down with, with crazy you, stuff I can, like that. I'm getting ten percent of those sales. <laughs> But, you know, I, in some ways, I like very traditional things, but I also experimenting all the time. So mixing up stuff like that. So it's not unlikely that they may get some Mapo Tofu doubles. Yeah. So, I mean, now that we know a little bit more about your lineage and where you come from as someone, you know, with connections to the Black and Asian community, yeah. and as well as someone who, you know, is in the hospitality industry this last year these last 12 months and even more than that it's just like one after another one after another yeah i mean how have you been handling it like how are you holding on well it's challenging you know from the food and beverage industry side like i have a restaurant that's in the airport so you can imagine specifically we are directly proportionate to what's happening in the travel industry and as you know travel has been decimated along with the hospi hospitality industry so i'm also getting a double whammy from the hospitality industry and then the travel industry there right mm -hmm. um but fortunately you know slowly it's picking up a little bit as the as people um, get vaccinations and are moving along um but you know we've managed to just operate on skeleton keep a few people on payroll and keep it moving um and serving the people who do need to go through the airport so i do see that and i talk to a lot of my friends in the restaurant industry uh and it it's crazy out there man it's really really a difficult time um the landlords are, are just a lot of landlords are very unforgiving and relentless and it's just it's burying a lot of restaurants and a lot of a lot of industry and you see that as you walk down the street and you see there's lease signs everywhere right so uh it's a very interesting it's a very interesting time but one thing about restaurant people they're very very resilient mm -hmm. yeah. and then how about you know personally as someone who has you know black and asian ancestry in these you know last 12 months it's been yeah i mean it's, it's been, been absolutely coffee turdy yeah i mean you know to be honest it's it's nothing that i'm not really accustomed to you know i'm i came from the caribbean and and we moved to edmonton alberta so you can imagine my family with the name moo king black people mixed with chinese going into edmonton alberta in late 70s early 80s um is it was very very difficult very challenging um so i've kind of been conditioned to that it's interesting to see the rest of the world kind of come to these realizations or, or many people in in the world come to these realizations as as though it's new information and then it bubbles to the surface and becomes this critical mass of information in a wave so you know interestingly enough for me when people see me they read me as just a black person right and so 
I'll get, you know, the regular anti-black racism stuff. But what they don't realize is that I'm also Chinese. So I will hear things, they, neighbors of mine, for instance, talking to me like they're woke about anti-black racism and turn around and complain about the Chinese neighbor for being Chinese and their food stinks and they make a mess. And, I'm like, <laughs> and so I think I'm like, okay, so you think you're woke but then you're saying all this sideways stuff that dragging dragging these chinese people you don't realize they don't they think they know me but they don't really know me right so th they don't realize that i am looking at going you, you have no idea <laughs> like my grandfather like, all of this stuff you're saying and so i just have to shut them down correct them let them know uh, and you just see the shock and awe on their face so it's interesting to see because there's this i've realized that there's this really hidden underbelly this raw sentiment against chinese people in north america and i see that more and more um and there's this underbelly of, of it you know and it's very seedy um so i i see that where, whereas as as, uh, as i read as a black person people are, like they just come at you against that right but for some reason, there's this insidiousness against Chinese people. So I'm still trying to figure that out and what that is. But I live in this intersection of it. So I get this very unique perspective of it as well. Right. Um, and it's frightening, you know, really, really, it's frightening. You know, I look at my my grandfather and, and that side of the family, all my aunts and uncles growing up, cousins. And they have a, a sensibility, and I think there's a sensibility of a lot of immigrants, but from what I've seen specifically from my family, the Chinese side of my family, is they have this sensibility that, okay, something bad happened, but I'll pretend I don't speak English and act stupid. And they do, I've seen them do that so many times, and they just kind of brush it aside and then go about their day, right? But we're living in this new era where uh it's okay you you just talk about it <laughs> you talk about it you speak about it you, con you confront them about it while you're there and, and check them or if you see that happening you check them you know um so th there's kind of this new generation cropping up of people who are like me or like you um who are are kind of battling against that that tradition you know yeah i mean i think there's with time and new generations i think there's a bigger understanding of the different layers of identity from that you're not just Chinese or you're not just Trinidadian. There's a lot of overlap. I mean, you're literally a li living example of that. Um, and that there's all, and then as generations keep going, it's, we're going to see more of that. Do you see that translating into Chinese cooking in Toronto kind of it's not just you know this province or that province but there's a lot more um cuisines from other countries kind of layering on especially with the younger generations of chefs coming up yeah absolutely you know you see people like uh Craig Wong or Nick Liu out there what they're doing with their restaurants and you see that exactly they're honoring the traditions the classics but they're doing this in a contemporary way for a young audience um who appreciates you know like just ADD of, of global information on Instagram and social media. So they see everything. They're like, I want to try a burger that has this hoisin on it. Like, what, what's that about? You, you know what I mean? And so you see those types of things. Um, so yeah, I think that's definitely, definitely something that, that that's going to continue and be more per pervasive. But you know, cooking is really a language, right? So if you look at language throughout history, it, it morphs, it changes. The dictionary is constantly adding new words and phrases to the dictionary because they're adapting and updating for the times, right? And food and, and culture is, is exactly like that. It's constantly evolving, moving, and there's always this, you know, wherever there's dynamic shifts and changes, you'll always kind of feel a rumbling of discontent, but also a real um, emotional effervescence around what's to come at the same time right and those two worlds live and play together at the same time always so it's constantly moving in flux and i think that the food is just again one of those languages that that move like that and it's constantly evolving so i can only anticipate i'm happy to be a part a little nugget in that in moving that ball um but you know it's incredible just there's so many people around doing great things with the cuisine and pushing it forward and right. globally i see that you know 
Yeah, I mean, that's why I always found the term Asian fusion to be so confusing. <laughs> you don't see it. There's, there's yeah. no other um, continent. <laughs> it's not like German that, fusion yet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, like you said, it, like uh, cooking is always changing. Ingredients are changing. Style of cooking is changing. Cooking equipment changes. So it's not necessarily like a fusion. It's just more like just it's just evolution. It's just it's just how, evolution. It's just yeah, how people natural. are. Yeah, that's how people are. Yeah, hundred percent, man. Absolutely. Yeah. And we evolve as a person. The person I am at twelve years old is a very different person than the person I am today. And even within ourselves, we evolve like that. Hopefully, right? And so, imagine you compound that with a with a partner, and then a community, and then that community expands, and then that community becomes a city, and that city becomes a province, and the province. Like, it just it's incredible, and it just it's exponential now too with just how we how quickly we translate and transform for information, right? Yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, our, our last question, and then I'll bring back uh, Tina and Lucia to our talk because we're having a party up here. Um, <laughs> so that being said, in the last 12 months, have there been any dishes or, or, or types of cooking, particularly within the world of Chinese cooking that you really miss do you miss coming gathering with like 10 of your friends at the big dim sum restaurant with the with the turntable in the middle do you miss that you know it's very funny just this weekend i have four daughters and me and my wife so every time we go to a restaurant it's like it is one of those events like that right um and my daughter just just this weekend that passed was saying man, I wish we could go out for dim sum. We haven't been to dim sum in like over a year. And in our household, we go to dim sum once a month, maybe twice a month, right? Um, and we'll try different things, different places. And, um, you know, there's the fallback places. But of the things that I really, really miss, yes, I miss dim sum the most. And my family, they, they told it to me. Um, but I really, I, over this last 12 months, I found this little Chung Fan place. Mm. Um, called uh, Yinji Chong Fun. Yes, in, they're good. They're oh good. man, good. it's good. <laughs> yeah. I hit the one in Mississauga. So recently we were Jones and so bad for dim sum. We said, yo, let's go do a car picnic. So we cleared out the car. We loaded up all, everybody into the car. And uh, I went out in my mask and I ordered takeout piles and piles of Chong Fun. <laughs> And so we loaded up, we opened everything out in the car and inside the car, we had a car picnic in the corner of the parking lot. And we got to have our little kind of mini dim sum moment during COVID. And um, it's just one of the brightest memories that I have of this whole COVID period. And, and you know, Chong Fan was central to it. <laughs> oh yeah, three weeks ago, I went to the Markham location of the rice noodle place and I ate behind the plaza like where like <laughs> folks go out and like smoke and like the yeah that's eat. the spot yeah um because you know i i i couldn't eat inside a restaurant and like there's no i didn't have a car <laughs> there's no picnic benches so i kind of just sat <laughs> on the pavement and just ate well, yo, that, that show fun never tasted so good it ever right good. well you have to eat it right there and then right you have there, yeah. you have 10 minutes at most at max, before it goes yeah. back. thank you so much roger that was an amazing chat and now we're going to bring back Tina and Lucia in um, to sit at our virtual giant <laughs> dim sum table and spin the uh, Lazy Susan around. Um, welcome back, <laughs> uh, Tina and Lucia. It's been really fascinating listening to both of your presentations. And I found it really interesting that you know Tina was saying that at Mandarin, you're bringing more you know, introducing more regional dishes and regional cooking uh, specific to you know certain areas within uh, China and beyond and uh, explain um, different periods of cooking and then Lucia talking about how Chinatown is you know kind of branching out more and kind of not being just this one particular, uh, kind of Chinese cooking. There's, you know, more rice noodle places coming in and more um, international uh, brands coming in. Um, and then Roger as well, from a global perspective, just seeing how different Chinese food is evolving around the world. 
like um, Lucia, you kind of talked about, you know, younger generations of chefs coming in and alongside the more older businesses and, you know, more different types of Chinese food coming in. Do you see this continuing on for the next five or 10 years? Yes, and I, I think I have this experience because I'm coming from Taiwan. So we, mm. in Taiwan, we have food that combined um, from different provinces in China. And eventually Taiwan has this uh, beef noodle that's like a Taiwanese cuisine, but it's actually combined um, the ingredients and the methods from different provinces. And I think it's happening in Canada in a different way that because we have immigrations from all over the world, so I think we will have a cuisine that's combined, maybe something from French, maybe something from from Trinidad, and maybe something from um, East Asia. So I think we will have something, maybe hoping that it's Canada own new mm. dishes. Um, I think that would be great, and I think that's we we I have been seeing like. In young entrepreneur are trying that already, so I think that maybe it will be the trend. Yeah. The oh, future. I was so excited to see so many hand pulled noodle places come open up in Chinatown in the last few years. Um, and then for Roger, you know, from all the different um, versions or iterations of Chinese cuisine that you've come across around the world, <clears throat> is there anything that you would like to see come to Toronto? Oh man, anything I love to see from Toronto. Oof, that's a tough question, man. I, I just, I've seen so much, you know, like I go to Singapore and I see like a chili crab and I'm like, oh, I want to get some chili crab here. But that's that's a very specific Singaporean, Singaporean cuisine thing as well, which is different than Chinese cuisine, right? Yeah. Um, but I tell you, I, I see kind of the future of it being a, something like what I see in Houston. Houston is a very multicultural city, actually. It, it's it's one of the most multicultural cities in America. I When I go there, I feel like I'm in Toronto, right? So I've sh shot some shows there with a, a Chinese uh, restaurant group. Um, they come up being like hip hop loving DJs, hanging around like hip hop and break dancing and DJing. But they're like truly Chinese people at, at heart, right? And grow up in the culture. So their restaurant really manifests that and they're in Texas. So they do all this stuff where they do smoked briskets and smoked ribs, very classic Texas style, but they sauce it and dress it and finish it or use techniques in the marinades or in the way that it's finished or, or even some of the smoking that are very Chinese, right? So you get this cuisine that is truly Texan, truly, truly Chinese, but with the heart and soul of hip hop, right? <laughs> and, and from this like young 30 year old group of, of guys, right? And so I look at that and I think, wow, you know, the Toronto is really like that in, from its multiculturalism. Austin in Texas is really like that. You go to Malaysia in many aspects, there's pockets like that, but we live in these unique pockets here in Toronto. So I really think that instead of stuff coming to us, we're going to be ones driving the ball and pushing it forward out to the world. And we have a very, I think, Torontonians really underappreciate how beautiful of a thing is that we have here in this city and and to be around and surrounded by so many cultures and and actually live these cultures and it's part of us and it manifests in the food and i kind of look at the future of of uh, the cuisines is coming from canada and toronto and be like this is how we're going to stamp it and send it out to the world instead of waiting for the world to come to us right wow. we have something special yeah for sure I'm going to throw it back to one of the uh, points that I made in my intro. I said that everyone watching, everyone participating in this talk, when I tell you to think of your favorite Chinese dish, we're all probably going to be thinking about completely different things, <laughs> which I think is why, you know, Leo and Arlene picked the four of us to be in this talk. You know, we're, we're all Chinese, but we all have very different backgrounds. So, when I ask each of you what your favorite Chinese dish is, tell me what it is and why. Uh, let's start with uh, Lucia. Oh my God, 
how can you ask this question to a Chinese person? There's no <laughs> one particular dish you like. Uh, but for me, for some reason, my whole family we love soup. So uh, currently, rice noodle it's my favorite. I always, especially in the winter time, you must have a what at least one rice noodle per week.、Mm. So I would choose that for now for this conversation. I'll give you a different answer next time. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure if I ask you like in five minutes, you'll be like, "No, I'm not crazy. I don't want that anymore. I want this." <laughs> Roger, what are you、uh, what are you craving at this moment? How, how about I ask it? No,、like、you know, I have a very definitive favorite. Chinese dish,、okay. um, and it and it really becomes from my family. You know, my grandfather's from a very poor, small village in Guangdong Province. Very humble, honest cooking.、Uh, taught this to my father, and we grew up eating this in my household. It's just old classic steamed salted chicken with the spring onion and the ginger oil with the chili. I mean, I look at that thing, and it just is heavenly to me. And you put some steam rice with some lap chong with that. Oh my gosh, it's over! Like it's just, it's just, it's comfort. It's just really beautiful, comforting food, packed with flavor, but coming from such an honest, earnest place of just true appreciation for good, simple techniques, great preparation. Hot food served hot at the moment, juicy, delicious, and、uh, hitting hitting every part of your palate in the most simple, comforting way.、Yeah. So,、uh, definitively, that for me is the one. Yeah, the, the rice have to have some lap chong on it though. <laughs> yeah,、so、I was gonna say I feel like the Chinese sausage is such an underrated ingredient.、Oh, you know,、so、there might be some people watching that don't know what lap chong is. Can you explain what it is? Lap chong is a is a sausage.、Uh, it's a small fingerish size sausage,、uh, right? And it's like、um, it, it's a sweetness to it.、Uh, there's generally it's a mix of pork and chicken, but it, there's a sweetness to it, and it has a slight、uh, red tinge to it, I guess.、Um, and it's absolutely delicious because it's sweet, salty, juicy, fatty. It has a good chew to it. Um, and it steams really well. It roasts really well into crispy little nuggets, or you can dice it up and, and mix it into things, or you chop it and put it in a leaf and steam it. Like there's just so many uses for it,、um, and I want to eat it right now. <laughs> I was kind of trying to think of like how what I would describe the taste of it, and it's so hard to do、it's、it. So hard, yeah. Because it doesn't. And can I add something? Yeah. Like my family back home. Um, around Chinese New Year, we would put the sausage outside on the rack to dry it. It's not it's not like the the sausage here.、Yeah. It's very dry, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it smells so, so good. good. So good. <laughs> yeah, I, Lucy, how would you describe the taste of it? Because it's not like a hot dog. No, like it. How can you compare? I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm being kicked out of this chat. For- <laughs> <laughs> I think、uh, there must be some、uh, soy sauce. Yeah, it does a have bit. a little bit about that taste. It has like sugar. Yes, it's a little yeah, sweet. Yeah, a little bit sweet. Salt. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome.、Um, you have to try it. We can't explain it to anyone. Yeah, it's it's so hard. <laughs> it's so hard to to describe. Um, I love、yeah. it so much. <laughs> <laughs>、um, and then、um, uh, Tina, I've thought of the dish. Okay. So,、ah, yes. 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 Too many. Too many choices here. Too many choices.、Um, and to、well, Tina, what do you think? Of, what What would you like to eat now? How about that? that, that. I would like to eat a classic Chinese steamed fish.、Mm. Oh yes. Just the steamed fish with the soy sauce, the scallions. Um, still remember growing up and going to restaurants with my my family every week, and having that as one of the dishes on the lazy susan. You have to have the right amount of fish with the sauce on your on your steamed rice. Right, craving right now. Yeah, my memories of seeing that at the restaurant is that the server will, with one hand, with a fork and a spoon, just in one hand, being able to debone and fillet the entire fish. Yes. And serve it to the people. That's right, with a lot of grace too. 
Yes, it was always one hand behind the back. I have no. It's it's such a lost art. So, Karon, what's your favorite dish? How about that? Put you well, on the thank, spot. Thank you for asking. I was <laughs> hoping that someone would ask. Um, so, I think that Chinese cooking does vegetarian food amazingly well. Like be- before Beyond Meat, before Impossible Burgers, like like the Buddhist monks already had this down for centuries, and they do um, seitan and like bean curd strips. Again, I don't know how to describe it. I think in English, they just call it gluten. Um, mm-hmm. You just basically take like gluten flour and you mix it with uh, like water and you get this like very like chewy, dense, meaty thing. And then you steam it. Sometimes you fry it and you marinate it in different sauces. And that's the one thing I've been, I've been ordering that the most uh, in this last 12 months during the pandemic. Um, there's a bunch of places in the city that do it. The place that's closest to my house is called Buddhist, Buddhist Vegetarian Kitchen. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been going there for like 30 years. Um, and it's probably existed longer longer than that. Um, it's very easy to be a uh, vegetarian if you're eating Chinese food. Very. Um, that being said, and then um, let's move on to our next question. Um, what's everyone been cooking? Is there, what's your go-to Chinese dish that you like to cook at home? You know, it may sound really cheap and corny, but again, one of my favorite memories, one of the first things I learned to cook and one of the first things I taught to my daughters was folding and wrapping wontons. I, I, I love just the ritual of folding wontons and also it triggers just a beautiful memory for me and to be able to pass that down and the kids love doing it they line up around the table they take their turns they have their you know they're dipping their chopstick and like it just is it just really warms my heart to do that with my kids because it, it just triggers so much goodness for me um and you know so we do the traditional ones with the little piece of meat in the corner and fry them and then some a little bit more full for soup and or I'll take them and kind of like toss them in like a chili oil and just have it like a bowl of, of dumplings sort of, you know? Yeah. But I, I just, I love making wontons. Just something just so, just, it hits me at home, you know? No, that's good. Start them young. It's too late for yeah, me. Yeah, start them young. <laughs> I, I, you got to start them young. You got to practice. It's too late for me to, to learn. My mom gave up on me on that front. <laughs> and now they know the types like they they know like three or four different folds now so they're like which ones do you want to do today and blah, blah, blah. so it's just so fun you know it's so fun i love it so much yeah and then uh tina and lucia do either of you cook at home yeah um i wanted to say something so roger said <laughs> my answer so you might do a different um, you might, also... might dumpling <laughs> Yeah, um, but I want, I like to do the traditional way we eat dinner, that we have a bowl of rice, we have a bowl of soup, and we have di- three, like, at least three different plates of different vegetables or a men. So I think it's it's quite different when you do take out or when you eat alone. Um, but I like to do that. It just reminds me of how we eat as an Asian, sit down and eat with family. And I love to buy different vegetables in the Chinese supermarket. We have so much more variety compared to um, the men uh, franchise. Mm. Uh, yeah, I love to try all kinds of different Chinese vegetables. Yeah, um, Tina, when you're you know not running a giant restaurant company, do you have any time to cook at home, or? I mean, if I were you, I would just like plunder the b- buffet. Like if I had <laughs> access to that, I would just never cook. If I had a restaurant at my disposal at the end of the day, I'll just take whatever's left over. I do like to cook um, and I get to do it occasionally. Um, over the winter, I was doing a lot of kanji, right? So we're doing a lot of kanjis, uh, just great, simple comfort food for the winter, super easy to do. Um, I actually had a really interesting food experience last week where a friend of mine dropped off a gooey duck, a live gooey duck clam on my front doorstep. 
Um, so I had the experience of, of cooking gooey duck for the first time. So that was, uh, I did a little bit of sashimi and did a bit of a congee with uh, the gooey duck. So. It's very advanced. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then. Um, That's a good one, Tina. That was a good one. That you had to squeeze in the chook. That's a really oh, good one. I, like <laughs> I did the sashimi three different ways. Oh. Wow. Wow. Crazy. Wait, I'm coming over to your house. Okay, anytime. <laughs> Wait, how is there more than one way of preparing sashimi? Different sauces and yes. Yeah. Okay, that that'll be um, on the next iteration when uh, Mandarin updates their menu, right? Some <laughs> just just Tina behind the station. It's at the carving station. Yep, carving yep. the gooey duck. Yeah, <laughs> and then. Um, Last question for uh, everyone. Uh, I feel like Toronto is truly a fantastic place for Chinese cooking. I, I truly believe it's unlike anywhere else in the world when it comes to the variety of, of Chinese cooking available. I do believe in my heart that we are spoiled. So last question for everyone on the panel. Why do you think, or do you think, Toronto stands out when it comes to Chinese cooking? Um, let's start with Roger again. You know, I really just think that it comes down to just, there's just so many people who came from ch the mainland in China uh, during the 70s, and there's a, just a legacy of the community here. And as a result of that, the demand and the access to authentic ingredients are just like on the mainland. Um, and you take that with the, you know, that adventurous spirit, um, entrepreneurial spirit, and that sensibility of like, we have to respect and honor this culture in a new place. And then you get this reinvigorated fervor and love for representing the culture, right? And you have the access to everything at your disposal authentically. So you mix those few things together and uh, it's a magical thing, you know, like I keep saying Tor Toronto is a special place on earth, man. It really, really is magnificent. Yeah, awesome. And then Lucia, like the downtown Chinatown, I re it's, it's unlike any other Chinatowns in the world, I feel like. Like every time I go to a new city, I always go to their Chinatown, but there's something about the one in Toronto that's just like, uh, it, I think it just blows all the other ones out of the water. <laughs> I feel like you have to agree because of your job. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> but like I mean, there had but, but just by working there over the years, like what do you think a bit about Chinatown or you know the Chinese community beyond Chinatown in the GTA that really makes it very special? I think I want to echo uh, Roger's answer that because we have a lot of people immigrant here directly from China, so we have really like authentic options here. For example, I never tried actually the real Sichuan hot pot here. The real Sichuan hot pot, it's numb. It's not just spicy, it's mm. numb your brain and I love it. So yeah. I learned how to eat this spicy here. And I think because uh, Chinatown, we have the open street. So it's we have the open heart to every different culture or community. So I think that makes us yeah. unique. Yeah. And then uh, Tina, I mean, like Mandarin restaurants thrive for so many decades and has so many locations, you know, for a reason. If there wasn't that demand for the type of Chinese cooking that the restaurants does, I mean, that that must speak to just how special Chinese food is to the people in the city. What do you think it is about Mandarin restaurants that has endured for so long and? so many people have all these memories about the restaurant and always come up to you and tell you their Mandarin stories. What do you think is so special about Mandarin that makes this possible? I think for us, it really comes down to the people that we've had the pleasure of being part of our team. Um, I don't think we would have, we, there's no way we would have gone to where we were without all of the staff and all of the partners that, that we have uh, to get us there. And we've just been lucky in a way that we've been able to work with these people and to be able to be part of people's lives over the years. 
Awesome. Okay. And with that, I think I've talked everyone's ears off and everyone's <laughs> tired of hearing my voice. So I would like to thank uh, Tina, Lucia, and Roger, and of course, uh, Arlene and Leo Tan for having all of us here to talk about Chinese food, what else? The thing that everyone absolutely <laughs> loves and the people behind it and the history and the culture and where it's going. And with that, I like to bid everyone a very lovely day and go out and get some takeout. <laughs> thank you. Thank you to Karen Liu and all of our panelists. And thank you to Arlene and Leo for curating this incredible series. A reminder, that books about Chinatown and the history of the Chinese in Canada can be found in the Toronto History Museum's online shop, and the link to the shop is available below. All four episodes of Chinese Food, Diversity, and Delights are posted to YouTube. Please follow, like, and subscribe to Toronto History Museums on social media for more of Chinese Food, Diversity, and Delights, as well as other Toronto History Museums programming. Thank you. <laughs>